Broadcasting live from the Newsmax studio in New York City, here is Steve Malzberg. And welcome back to the Steve Malzberg Show. I am Mary Walter. Uh, joining me is Betsy Woodruff. She is the political reporter for the Washington Examiner. She's a former Capitol Hill reporter for the National Review. And she is psychic because she predicted that Eric Cantor would lose. And nobody else did. Betsy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm well. Thanks for having me. So now tell me about your psychic abilities, uh, because you were the one who predicted that Cantor would lose and nobody else saw this coming. What made you say that? Why did you think this was going to happen? Well, I sat down with Dave Bratt back in January when he first announced that he was going to run. We met at the National Review DC offices, talked for about an hour, went out for lunch afterwards, talked with him and his consultants, and then I called a bunch of Virginia folks. And what I heard, and most importantly from a former grassroots director for Congressman Cantor, was that Bratt was going to be the most formidable primary challenger that Cantor would ever face. Uh, not necessarily that he would win, but that if anyone was going to beat him, Bratt was best postured. At least of folks who've run against Cantor in the past. And then if you look at what happened over the, over the previous weeks, a perfect storm get, came, came together and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, now why, why was everyone saying that he's such a great candidate to be Cantor? What was it about him? He's a nice guy. I hear he's very affable. He's, he's very nice. He's a straight shooter. But that doesn't mean you're going to win. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, you could be the nicest guy in the world and still lose. So what is it about him? There are a lot of nice people walking around, that's true. Uh, I think what makes Bratt a compelling candidate is he's got the public policy experience. He volunteered for State Senator Walter Stosh on education policy. He was on Governor Tim Kaine's Board of Economic Advisors. So he has kind of some of that heavy-hitting policy background. And then also he was very close with a lot of the grassroots folks. So he kind of has a foot on both sides of the fence here, if you will. Uh, right. He's both familiar with Richmond insiders, but also you know knows his way around grassroots. Tea Party, Libertarian, activists in Virginia's 7th District. And he apparently ran a shoestring campaign, which I don't think people understand. Eric Cantor spent something like $5 million on this campaign, and Bratt spent, what, less than 150000 right? Mm -hmm. In that ballpark, yeah. Right. So how did he do it? What did he do? His, his campaign manager is 23 years old and is sleeping on some guy's couch, apparently, um, which is true. I don't say that to be funny. It's really true. Um, so how did he do it? I mean, $150,000 beat a $5 million campaign. Did he use social media? Was he you know, standing at, at, at a local grocery store shaking hands? What did he do? Well, not to poo-poo Brat's accomplishment, but I yeah. think it's yeah. fair to say that in this case, it's less a situation of Brat winning so much as of Cantor losing. Oh, okay. Cantor really bundled it. He wasn't very visible in the district, didn't really have yard signs, you know, spent most of his money on negative ads against Dave Bratt mm -hmm. that actually dramatically raised that guy's profile. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and Cantor's folks just weren't that involved. And on top of that, there'd been bad blood brewing between Cantor and grassroots activists in the district. Young Guns Virginia, which is a group that's an offspring of a group that Cantor founded, invested a lot of time and resources in going after conservative activists who are district chairmen throughout Virginia. So these conservative activists who in the past hadn't really angled to go after Cantor had said, eh, guy's too big of a fish to fry, we're not going to worry about it. When Young Guns Virginia came after them, a lot of these guys said, heck no, it's open season, gunning for Cantor. Right, okay, so it was really more, like you said, of Cantor losing than necessarily Brett winning the, the election. So um, he, he had grassroots behind him. Now, we hear a lot, I'm hearing a lot today about, you know, because the left is saying this is the sign that the Tea Party won. But correct me if I'm wrong, the Tea Party there did not give him, and there's several, there's no Tea Party organization, but on a national level, he didn't get a dime from any, and no support from the Tea Party, any of the national organizations. Is that correct? Yeah, that so, is. He didn't get any big money from significant outside groups. Why is that? Why didn't he? I mean, if he's the darling of the Tea Party, as everyone's telling me today, why didn't he get any support from them? And even the Tea Party is out talking, you know, making, making the rounds, these talking heads from the Tea Parties, like he's their guy when they didn't support him. Why didn't they support him? Well, I think people just didn't believe he could pull it off, which is fascinating because yeah. there was so much money poured into Matt Bevin's race against Mitch McConnell. Right. We all know what happened there. Right. But Brad just never really sold himself to these 
national organization, so they stayed out. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's definitely weird to paint this as a Tea Party win when national Tea Party groups really can't take any responsibility for Eric Cantor's loss. Now, do you think the left is painting this as a Tea Party win because they don't want to paint it as a vote against immigration? And that's what a lot of people are saying. This was not about the Tea Party. This was about immigration. Is that what this was about? I think it's about a, a confluence of factors. Immigration is certainly an important part. Uh, without the immigration centrality in Brett's campaign, he wouldn't have gotten support from Laura Ingram, Ann Coulter, right, and Mark Levin. Right. Support from them was pivotal, especially in the final weeks, as far as Brad gaining gaining popularity, gaining visibility, getting money. So that's absolutely an essential part. But another important thing to bear in mind is that Brad's political background is much more much more emphasized towards compromise and actually hard policy work than it is towards maybe sign waving or protesting or. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of a lot of what we traditionally think of as activism. The the state senator that he worked for was a moderate Republican. He was on Democratic Governor Tim Kaine's board of economic advisors. Brad is not a guy who's afraid of reaching across the aisle. He's not a guy who's afraid of working with people who are not ideologically aligned with him. And I think the left really misses that, and to their detriment, when they suggest he's some sort of ideologue or bomb thrower. Now, now talking about the left. Is it Virginia has an open primary, which means that anybody can vote for anybody, correct? Right. Okay, so is it true that Democrats were urging their people to go and vote for Brat to defeat Eric Cantor because they think it's easier to beat him than it would be to beat Eric Cantor? Yeah, I think there was a little bit of that. Uh, that was a factor, but not not a game changer. You know, there was some, and you, and you hear stuff along those lines. And I mean, certainly, I'm sure some Democrats voted in the Republican primary, but. Cantor's folks really can't blame any Democratic sabotage on his loss. And also, the other thing to remember here is that this is a really solid Republican district. Brat mm -hmm. is still the prohibitive favorite. I highly doubt national Democrats are going to spend on the Democratic candidate there, just because Eric Cantor got this district made so it would always be easy for him to win in generals. And now okay. Brat's okay. enjoying the spoils of that. So you pretty much think it's, it's a given that he, who is he going to be running against? I think the guy's name is Trammell. He's all he's another professor at the college where Dave Bratt works. Really? So, yeah. yeah. They're both at, and it's this tiny little school too, and they're both professors. They're both at Randolph Macon, oh, yeah. Cool. So they'll have some interesting faculty meetings. Yeah. That's very interesting. And you, and you think that Bratt's just a given to win just based on the makeup of the district in and of itself. One of my best Virginia sources, uh, who's been involved in Republican politics in the state for a long time, I talked about it with him election night. He was floored. He didn't expect <laughs> Brett to win at all, but he said, now that Brett's won, he's the favorite of favorite. Okay. So, take that um, do you, and, and obviously, you know, people voting on name recognition did not come into play here. So he was very good. I, I, I guess Cantor was very good at getting Bratt's name out there by negative campaigning against him. Um, how many people, how, what percentage of possible voters actually voted in the primary? Because I think that that's really huge and it has a lot to do with this. I don't, I don't know the specific number, but I do know this primary had a much bigger turnout than the last Republican primary. That's an important thing to bear in mind here. And especially also talking about this negative ad, there's kind of an interesting parallel to what happened when Senator Ted Cruz defeated Dewhurst in his runoff. Dewhurst put up ads that were incredibly negative against Cruz, you know, suggested he was red Ted, suggested he supported communism. And those ads dramatically raised Cruz's profile. Sure. The exact same thing happened to Dave Bratt. You'd think folks would learn not to do that, but I guess the majority leader missed the message. Yeah, that's a very interesting message, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm sure that the, the other people who are going to be running are taking lessons from this. Uh, and, and could this possibly be my dream, because I, I really would love to see people just starting to vote out incumbents. I, I just think it's time. We need to sweep it clean, and everyone says that, but they want the other guy's guy voted out. They don't want their guy voted out. Could this be part of that? You know, look, Eric Cantor's been there too long. It's time to sweep it out. It's time for fresh blood. It's a good question. Um, I spoke with the campaign manager for Joe Carr, who's a Tea Party candidate running against Senator Lamar Alexander in mm -hmm. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. The campaign manager said they've seen a dramatic spike in mm -hmm. volunteering, in donations, in earned media since Tuesday at about 10 p.m. Campaign manager said it's possible it's a game changer if they end up winning. Part of the reason for that is going to be because of the injection of energy that came after Brat beat Cantor. So Carr in Tennessee is definitely the one who's most likely to benefit from this. That's a race to keep an eye on. Well, that is the best news I've heard all day. That makes me happy. There's hope. I actually have hope for change. Ah. <laughs> and lastly, I just want to ask you, uh, just very quickly, we don't have a lot of time. Is this the rise of the Tea Party, and do you see this as a bigger fraction in the Republican Party? 
definitely a bigger fraction. Okay. Uh, I imagine Brat's not going to have the warmest welcome ever on Capitol Hill. And it's also an injection of energy to the Tea Party. Even though the Tea Party can't really claim a scalp here, mm -hmm. the Tea Party can definitely capitalize on it and say, look, there's an appetite to throw the bums out. If we can take out Canner, we can take out anyone. Right, right. Well, that's good. It's invigorating, and I'm glad to see that this is motivating people. Now, since you are clearly psychic, I was wondering before we go, um, since you were you predicted this, would you be able to share any lottery numbers with me? Uh -huh. I'm keeping those myself, man. I get, come on, do some good. <laughs> Well, I hope we have you back because I'd let you know, I think we need to follow this and to look at how these are going with some of these other races, like you said, to watch uh, with, with these incumbents, hopefully getting the boot, which would be wonderful. Um, I, I, I don't care who they are. I think they need to go. Thank you so much. Betsy Woodruff, I appreciate you joining us. Political reporter for the Washington Examiner, former Capitol Hill reporter for the National Review, and the only person to predict that cancer would lose. Fantastic. Coming up, more Steve Malzberg and Gimme Five. That's next.